<laughs> Welcome, TikTokers. Christmas Day is almost here. For us, it is one of our favorite times of the year. We love walking with the Christmas lights shining through our city while listening to Mariah Carey and other Christmas carols in the background. And as it couldn't be otherwise, for a few years, we have not missed the appointment of experiencing a Christmas night special with you. Full of curiosities, stories, and legends typical of these dates. And of course, terror, which we know is your favorite theme. Therefore, we believe that a good start is to start this special video by telling you a Japanese Christmas horror legend. Get ready to meet the Japanese Santa Claus. Santa Kurosu. Let's start! Years ago, in the heart of Japan, an urban legend began to circulate that soon became a nightmare that terrified all children. The story, which was already several decades old, revolved around a macabre event that occurred on a date supposedly full of joy and gifts, Christmas Eve. But instead of bringing joy and happiness, this legend darkened Christmas with the sinister figure of Santa Claus. According to rumors, if you ventured out for a walk alone on Christmas Eve, you might meet Santa Claus, but not the kind, good, chubby one we all know. This was a dark Santa, a corrupted version of the terror-inflicting Christmas figure known as Santa Kurosu. This creepy Santa's appearance was grotesque and twisted. He wore ragged red clothes and a frayed cap, and a foul smell emanated as he walked. His white beard was full of bugs and dirt, and he carried a red sack from which a strange and disturbing liquid dripped. The most disturbing feature of this legend is that only children had the misfortune to encounter this apparition of Santa, and their stories were shocking. Adults would never witness his presence. The legend dates back to a gruesome event that took place a long time ago. A boy of about 10 years old was walking alone around 11.30 on the night of December 24th. Suddenly, he encountered the chilling signed Kudosu, who approached him and asked him the following question. Do you want me to give you a foot? The boy, frightened but thinking that the man was just a person who had drunk too much at the celebration, chose to ignore the question and continued on his way. However, it wasn't long before the boy realized that the old man was following him at a short distance, insistently repeating, Do you want food? And again. The boy couldn't take the pressure anymore, and in a desperate attempt to push the man away, finally gave in. No, I don't want any fate. What happened next was a terrifying scream that echoed through the night. Neighbors came running when they heard the noises, but what they found was a horrific scene. The boy lay in a pool of his own blood, with his right foot amputated and on the verge of death. The terrible encounter left scars in the memories of all the neighbors, and the story spread quickly. The legend became even creepier when it was discovered that there were other children who, after hearing about the rumor, responded affirmatively when Santa asked them his scary question. However, accepting the offer was not a good idea either. Well, right after, Santa Kudosu tried to soothe them a third leg, which he took out of his bloody sack full of other children's limbs, and left the little ones with three legs on their tiny bodies. It is said that the only way to escape from Santa Kudosu is to tell him that you know a friend who does want the food and you must give him his address. Santa will go in search of your supposed friend and leave you free without harming you. Although you shouldn't try to deceive him and underestimate him because the evil Japanese Christmas Santa might return and take revenge. The story soon became part of local culture, and children in small Japanese towns lived in terror every Christmas Eve, knowing that the creepy dark Santa might cross their path. And you, would you prefer to sacrifice a friend's food to save yours? Wow, this question has given us an idea. What do you think if we play Would You Rather? I hope my friends don't go overboard with the level of questions. Let's go. 1. What do you prefer? Never wear underwear again or only be able to wear used underwear? 
Oh my, we're off to a good start. Let's go. I want to state that I don't like either of the two options, but hey, if I have to choose one, I'd go without underwear. I think I'd rather that than get an infection of my private parts. 2. What do you prefer, Santa Claus or the Three Wise Men? Well, here I think I have the clearest answer. I really like Christmas Day and receiving gifts from Santa Claus, but without a doubt, my favorite day since I was a little girl is the Three Kings Day. 3. What do you prefer? Be the culprit of burning Christmas food or breaking your brother or sister's gift by accident? Well, very clear too. I definitely prefer to burn food. There are a lot of sweets, no one's going to go hungry. But breaking a brother's gift? This is how many wars have started, guys. <laughs> what do you prefer? Eat a cake flavored poop or a poop flavored cake? What? Gross. I can't choose. Let's see. Does poop taste good? I can I cannot. I cannot. It's still poop, but the cake does taste like excrement. Well, it's not good for me either. Ah, it's super difficult. Come on, poop that tastes like cake. What do you prefer? Know what day you will die or know in what way you will die? None. Both of them seem terrible to me. Wow, how difficult. Um, let's see. I think knowing the day has to be terrible at its approaches. So, yeah, I prefer to know how, how I will die. What do you prefer? No one showing up to your wedding or no one showing up to your funeral? Well, I think to the funeral. It would be very sad, but meh, I won't find out. However, to the wedding and on top of how expensive everything is, nah, nah, funeral without a doubt. What do you prefer? Earning $50,000 right now or get 5 euros for every day you have left in your life? Let's see, let me do a quick calculation. If the year has 365 days, mmm, um, eh, I don't care. I want the money now, they might regret it later. $50,000 here, please. Come on, the last one. What do you prefer? Have your mouth in your ass or your ass in your mouth? I do not understand the mind of the person who invented this question. Um, having your mouth on your butt must taste terrible. By the way, some good buttocks on the face. After this interrogation, I need some time to lower the colors in my face. Will you join us to watch a Christmas horror story together? And don't go, this Christmas night special has only just begun. The entire Miller family was in the living room of the house laughing and toasting. It was Christmas Eve and they celebrated affection, love and togetherness. Everyone except Owen, who considered that those parties were nothing more than a consumer invention. He was 14 years old and had lost all the Christmas spirit. His aunt and uncle, Mary and Dan, had driven five hours to spend the holidays together and had brought the drinks. The mother had prepared a delicious roast, the father had decorated the room with ornaments, and the grandmother had prepared homemade sweets. Everyone had contributed something to the celebration. However, the young man had only stuck to sitting at the table with a bad face, waiting for the time to go to sleep. The oven bell rang. The gingerbread cookies were ready, and Grandma asked Owen to take them out of the oven and decorate them, so they would have them ready the next day for breakfast. Owen snorted and rolled his eyes. Why did he have to? His mother looked at him, raising her eyebrows, and he quickly knew that it was not an offer, but an order. He carefully removed the cookies from the oven. His grandmother had left the mixtures with colors to decorate in several bowls. Then he began to speak out loud. I hate Christmas. I hate these useless gingerbread cookies. I hate Christmas carols and the star decorations all over the house. While cursing all Christmas customs, he was decorating the pastries with evil and devilish faces. He told his grandmother that they were already decorated, the dough just needed to cool overnight and they would be ready to eat. He laughed to himself, thinking of the horror on the old woman's face when she saw them. They all said goodnight and went to sleep. The house was silent waiting for the arrival of Santa Claus and his gifts for the family. 
However, the one who slipped through the miller's chimney was not the good-natured one that everyone expected, but Krampus did. He walked over to the kitchen, and when he saw the gingerbread cookies, he had an idea. He passed his hand over them and went to other houses to scare the children. Seconds later, the decorated mass began to move. Krampus had given them life. The cookies spilled out of the tray and they began to get into mischief. They dumped the food they found, emptied the shelves and even tossed the glass bottles to the ground, breaking them into hundreds of pieces. The noise of glass woke up Owen, who, believing that he would finally find Santa Claus in his house, ran downstairs. When he got to the kitchen, he couldn't believe what he was seeing. It could be that a thief had broken in if it weren't for the fact that nothing had been taken. Everything was lying on the ground. Then he approached the Christmas tree and he realized that there were no gifts under it. Santa Claus hadn't yet arrived. As he was leaving, he looked at the tree again. There were gingerbread cookie decorations. He grabbed one in his hand, and they were the cookies he had decorated. Suddenly, the gingerbread cookie bit his finger and Owen threw it to the ground. The rest of the cookies jumped from the tree and climbed up his feet, biting his legs. The young man didn't understand what was happening. He kicked at the air and tried to get rid of them. The cookies could not stop laughing as they attacked him. They grabbed the electric stapler Owen's father had used for the decorations and began driving staples through the buddy. The child was screaming, although none of his relatives came down to help him. The cookies managed to make him fall. He couldn't get up, his clothes had been stapled to the floor. He was trapped. One of the pastas grabbed a pair of scissors and walked straight to cut him in the face. But suddenly, the family dog took a bite of the cookie and then all the others. Owen breathed easy. That nightmare was over. He managed to free one arm and patted the pet on the head. However, something had changed forever in his dog. We're back! We're going to tell you a curiosity that we have discovered and that has surprised us a lot. Did you know that in Japan, it is typical to celebrate Christmas with KFC? Yeah, yeah, the fried chicken company. This country has adopted KFC chicken as the star of Christmas dinner. All of this began 40 years ago when a marketing campaign made it clear that this food chain was synonymous with Christmas and family reunions. Its impact was so great that today the Japanese reserve their fried chicken pieces up to three months in advance. Although, like everywhere, many wait until the last minute and it is common to see long lines of Japanese lingering in front of KFC establishment for hours and hours. The KFC Christmas menu is presented in a container barrel with Christmas decoration, costs about 40 euros and usually consists of 8 pieces of chicken, salad, Christmas cake, drink and a decorative Christmas plate. Did you know this information? Before continuing with more curiosities, let's see another Christmas video together. It was Christmas Eve once again, and Marcus' parents couldn't stop thinking about the letter that their son had left for them to read. A year had passed since little Marcos wrote it. Christmas was a miserable time for them all, as all those horrible memories from that fateful night would come flooding back. Dear family, friends, and strangers who might be reading this, I need you all to know my story. Many of you might think that I've turned completely insane, and I honestly wish that was true and that everything was just a product of my imagination. I'm sure that all of you know who Santa Claus is. Many call him that, others call him Saint Nicholas or Father Christmas. Doesn't really matter. We all know that chubby mister who leaves presents in our houses on the night of the 24th of December. But let me ask you, have any of you actually seen him? Thousands of millions of kids in the world and you tell me that nobody has ever seen him in person? Many believe they have the answer, but they're all wrong. I can assure you that none of you actually know him. Christmas was my favorite time of the year and we would always celebrate it at my house with all the family. After the Christmas Eve dinner, my cousin Juan and my aunt Anna would spend the night with us so we could all open the presents together the next day. 
Juan would sleep with me, and the adults would always tell us, You gotta go to sleep soon. If you don't, Santa will not leave your presents. Children need to be sleeping for Santa to be able to come in. And I would think, that's so stupid. What difference would it make if I get to see him? If I did, I could thank him for all the presents he had given me throughout the years. But that last year, I would have preferred a video game console instead of socks and boxers. Now, Juan and I had other plans. That night, we would wake up in the middle of the night while everyone else was asleep, and we would be the only kids in the world to see Santa face to face. 3 a.m. came, and all we could hear were the snores of my father. We tiptoed to make as little noise as possible. We were also carrying our bed sheets, just in case. We hid behind the couch, and we waited. And since nothing was happening yet, we grabbed and ate some of the leftover chocolate candies from dinner. Suddenly, we heard a loud noise coming from the chimney. We weren't sure if we should come out of our hiding place or not. What if it was true that if he saw us, he wouldn't leave our presence? And so we remained hidden. Shortly after, we saw feet landing inside the fireplace. Oh man, I was so nervous. I was about to see Santa himself. I peeked a bit to see him better. Uh, Santa was facing away from us, carrying his huge sack of presents. However, we noticed something strange. Some sort of red and slimy liquid was oozing out of the sack. And then Juan forcefully grabbed my arm and whispered to me, Marcus, we have to get out of here. I think this is dangerous. Suddenly, Santa turned around and saw us. He didn't have the face of a nice old man that we all imagine. Instead, his eyes were huge and completely black. Juan peed his pants, and I was struggling to not do the same thing. Do not scream unless you want to end up like them, said Santa in a terrifying voice. He opened his sack, and I found out what that red liquid actually was. Blood. The sack was filled with children, corpses, their organs and intestines pouring out of their dead bodies. The living room now had a huge puddle of blood in the middle of it. Juan couldn't avoid screaming. I tried to shut him up by covering his mouth, but he was completely out of it. He was screaming like crazy, as if he was having a panic attack. Santa then approached him, and I couldn't watch. I closed my eyes shut and covered my ears. I still didn't scream. In my head, I repeated, Mom, Dad, please help me. But nobody came. And when I opened my eyes, Santa and Juan were no longer there. My parents came, turned on the lights, and found a living room filled with blood and a knife in the middle. We never saw Juan again. He disappeared forever. My aunt Anna still hates me to this day, since she never believed me when I said that Santa killed him. I was also locked into a psychiatric institution because nobody believed me. And now, all I know is that you should never get out of bed on Christmas night. We continue with curiosities. What we're going to tell you now is going to amaze you. In Greenland, there is a Christmas dish called kiviak that is made with raw meat of the auk, which is an aquatic hunting bird. This is still not very strange, but that meat is wrapped in seal skin and buried for several months until it reaches a high level of decomposition. For them, that rotten meat is the most anticipated dinner. It is something we definitely wish we didn't have to try. We continue with another video, TikTokers. It all started when I went to Sweden to work as an au pair. I was helping a family take care of their kids, and in my free time, I would tour around the country and study Swedish. And since I loved children, it was a win-win situation for me. The family lived in Stockholm. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna make a joke about Stockholm Syndrome or anything like that. Especially since I actually loved living with the Andersons. They welcomed me with open arms since the first day and treated me as another one of their children. Their kids, Elsa and William, spoke in perfect English so we could communicate with each other without issues. 
Then Christmas time came and I would have to spend the holidays away from home. However, I was living an entirely new experience, so I wasn't feeling as sad as I thought I would. The children told me that on Christmas night, besides Santa, the Tomte also made an appearance. Who are the Tomte? In Sweden, that's the name of a particular group of Christmas gnomes that look similar to garden gnomes. Yes, those same garden gnomes many dads put on their lungs among the flowers to decorate them. Personally, I think they look horrible. But anyways, back to the topic, let's talk about the Tomte. They usually wear a woolen tunic, a belt, pants that go to their knees, and tall socks. It is said that they're in charge of protecting and watching people's houses, so long as the homeowners treat them well. They also take care of farm animals as well as animals in stables. And you might be thinking, oh, those gnomes are adorable. Well, no. If they can say there that they have been mistreated, they can end up killing your livestock, steal from you, and make your life impossible. Instead of coming down the chimney, the Tomte come in through the main door. And after dinner, they leave presents for the family. Therefore, it is a tradition to leave them a bowl of oatmeal with butter and almonds as a thank you. And if the Tomte don't receive their food when they come, they can be very dangerous. William and Elsa said that they were Santa's helpers and that we needed to treat them well. And I would play along with them since they were just kids. It was normal for them to believe that tiny gnomes would get into the house to leave presents. So after Christmas Eve and leaving the bowl with oatmeal and butter, which looked pretty terrible by the way, I put the children in bed. Mr. and Mrs. Anderson also went to bed, so I then decided to grab that oatmeal and flush it down the toilet so the kids would believe that the Tomte actually ate it. And the next day, a scream woke me up. It couldn't be. The family's horses and the hands were all dead. What animal could have caused this? It was possible for the hands to have been killed by foxes, but the horses? Little Elsa went into the house looking for the oatmeal bowl she left for the Tomte. Mr. and Mrs. Anderson were disconcerted and asked me if I had emptied the bowl. So, I had to lie to them. And I know, I know, it was wrong of me to lie to them, but how could I tell them that it was my fault? That evil knows were now going to make their life impossible. Let's see if you are true Christmas lovers with this express test that we are going to take. We will now ask you several questions and you will have to write down the answers. So, pause the video, grab a pen and paper, and write down the question number and your answer next to it. Do you have it? Let's start! 1. What color was Santa's suit until Coca-Cola turned it red? 2. Which country made placing and decorating the Christmas tree a global tradition? 3. Who is the green character who stole Christmas? 4. If you go under this plant, you will have to kiss someone. Which is it? 5. One of Santa Claus's reindeer is called Cupid. True or false? We pause to enjoy another video together and we return with the answers. The first time you get to meet your girlfriend's family is an important event. One day, you might become part of our family, so you gotta give a good first impression. Be attentive, fun, and charming, but always in a natural and non-forced way. And overall, don't be nervous and make them feel like you are one of them. When I was 25 years old, I was sure that Laura was the woman of my life. She was intelligent, sweet, successful, and the most generous person I've ever met. We had been together for two years and everything was perfect. Her family lived very far away, so I hadn't met them in person yet. I did get to know them through video calls, but you know that it isn't the same. Christmas Eve finally came. The big day. Her family spent the holidays here, staying in Laura's spacious and modern house where we were going to have her Christmas dinner. I arrived late because of work. 
I was worried about that, as the night was just getting started and I was already giving off a bad impression. However, Laura's father didn't care. He received me at the door with a big smile and a warm hug. I tried to apologize for being late, but he didn't care. He simply told me that work is work and that is that. Now that I was seeing him in person, his appearance surprised me a lot. For a middle-aged man, he looked extraordinarily young and healthy. He was tall, handsome, and in good shape. I was about to discreetly ask him about his age, but he immediately took me to the dining room to meet in person the rest of the family. They were all very delightful and showered me with compliments. Laura's mom was very happy to see me and even gave me two kisses on the cheek. Her appearance surprised me even more than that of her husband. She didn't look like she was older than 30, and if you compared her with Laura side by side, you would think they were sisters. And the last one to greet me, who was less effusive but is still kind, was their older son. He was a handsome young man, dressed elegantly as if he was a magazine model. His hair was perfectly combed and his teeth were sparkling white. Anybody would fall for him in an instant. I started to feel a bit strange and uncomfortable. Compared to that perfect postcard family, I was feeling like a bum who was being invited to their Christmas dinner out of charity. They surely looked a thousand times better than in a video calls. But I suppose webcams don't make anyone look especially good. While Laura was getting ready, we sat down and started chatting to get to know each other better. I started thinking about how lucky I was for finding such a good-looking and interesting family and eventually become part of it. I don't complain about my own family, not at all. I love my parents very much, but let's say they have a different style. Half an hour passed and Laura started coming downstairs. She looked gorgeous, more beautiful than ever. She looked like an angel coming down the stairs. This was all perfect, like a dream. Without thinking about it, I took a small box I had in my pocket and decided to go forward with the biggest step I had been thinking about taking for a while now. I knelt in front of her, showed her a ring in the box and proposed to her in front of her family, who smiled out of surprise and excitement. Tears of joy escaped from her eyes and she hugged me strongly. Her parents and brother also came closer to hug us and congratulate us. This was the perfect Christmas with the perfect family. Dinner time finally came and we sat around the carefully set table. I preferred not to eat many appetizers, eagerly awaiting for the main dish. I was so hungry that when I saw Laura's dad and brother carrying out of the kitchen a huge tray covered with a metal cover, my mouth started watering. What was under there? I didn't ask and waited for them to take the cover off. For a few moments, I wasn't sure about which animal's roasted meat was in the tray, which looked pretty good along with a fine garnish. Then, I took a closer look at the shape of the cut-off limbs and I couldn't believe it. I was in shock. It can't be, it must be my imagination, but it looked like a finely cooked human body. The eyes of the rest of the family were shining and they congratulated Laura and her mother for being such good cooks. I could hardly speak, but I managed to say, but, but is, is this? Laura confirmed what I was suspecting, as if it were the most natural and normal thing in the world. They even started talking about how to prepare it, which spices to use and the oven's temperature, while they served pieces of legs, thorax and arms. I discreetly looked at the head, and I could notice it belonged to a young teen. But the most terrifying part was not seeing them eat a roasted human. It was the strange sensation that with each bite they had, their skin seemed to become shinier, and their aura of elegance increased. Laura's father gave me a pat on the back, encouraging me to eat. Come on, boy, you can't be eternally young and handsome without, you know, a little sacrifice. And it's only once a year. He told me while he gave a bite to what looked like a humorous. The situation seemed so natural and their explanations were so convincing that 
I started to reconsider. Laura took my hand, looked at me in the eyes, and with the sweetest of smiles, asked me, Do you actually love me? Don't you want to be like us and spend the rest of your life with me? I didn't answer. I served a piece of leg on my plate and stubbed it with my fork. I closed my eyes, opened my mouth, and determined to take the next step, I said, I do. We are back with the answers to the test. Let's see how many you got right. First, what color was Santa's suit until Coca-Cola showed us red? The answer is green. The next one was quite complicated. The first country to put up the Christmas tree was Germany. Next, who is the green character who stole Christmas? The answer is the Grinch. The plant that makes us kiss if we pass under it, the mistletoe. And is one of Santa's reindeer named Cupid? That's how it is. The question was true. How many answers did you have right? If you are all right, you are true lovers of these dates. We continue now with another video. I was 23 years old and I'd been living all on my own for a few years. My parents died in a traffic accident when I was 18 and I had no other relatives. So when I lost my job, I got really worried. I had to find a way to pay rent or I would be thrown out. I spent weeks where I would search for jobs every single day until I eventually saw a help wanted sign on a video games and movies rental store called Video World. I went in, talked to the owner, and he gave me a job after barely asking me about myself. I was so happy. I would now earn enough money to pay the rent. Moreover, the first days on the job were great. I had the night shift, so I had to work from 8pm to midnight. Not many people went into the store at those hours, so my job was pretty easy. However, on one of the first nights, I had a strange sensation. I felt the hunch that something not very pleasant would happen soon. Out of the store, a thick fog started to invade everything inside. From within, we could barely see the other side of the street. The last customers had already left and only me and the security guard remained. It was pretty late and I wanted to go home, but the guard warned me about how difficult it would be for me to find my way home in the middle of such a thick fog. And so we decided to wait for it to dissipate. We watched a movie in the meantime until the guard asked me to go with him to the storage room in the back to look for some old shows and take them to the store. The storage had to be accessed from outside so we had to go out. It was a dark and extremely cold room. Once inside, we started to take out a few boxes, but suddenly, one of the windows opened on its own and a furious gust of wind pushed a pile of boxes which started falling my way. Not gonna lie, I was very scared. However, when I saw the guard <laughs> laughing at that scene, I felt better. He pushed the boxes aside and when I stood up, one VHS tape caught my attention. There was something written on it. Looney Tunes, the Daffy Duck Martyr. A shiver went down my spine when I read that title and it made me remember the most traumatic events from my past. The guard asked me if I was okay, so I showed him the tape and he suggested that we watched it inside. At first I refused. Something inside me was telling me it wouldn't be a good idea, but I ended up accepting. We went back into the store, put the tape in the VHS player and prepared some snacks. The Looney Tunes intro immediately appeared on the screen, but it was distorted as if it had some sort of haze effect. It also had no music, which was kind of strange. The phrase Looney Tunes presents was also different. It would get closer and closer to the camera, but so slowly that it seemed to be some kind of editing error. It was so weird, and the guard looked at me with a dumbfounded expression as he kept on eating his snack. I was starting to feel creeped out. Then some sort of badly drawn hands covered in a red liquid appeared in the intro, followed by a voice that said, You'll never forget this, folks! Followed by a loud and disturbing laughter. <laughs> the guard seemed entertained. 
He probably thought it was just a creepy fan-made project or something like that. And outside, the fog was getting even more thick. So much so that nothing could be seen outside. Thus, we couldn't go home yet. The intro was over and now we were seeing a black circle. It was similar to those which usually appear in cartoons. The ones that get smaller and show a character. However, this time around, the circle was getting bigger and bigger until it covered the entire screen. And then, Bugs Bunny appeared. He was walking, and the scene was repeating itself over and over again. Then we saw how he took a carrot out of his pocket and started to devour it. He wasn't eating it normally. He was furious. The next scene showed Bugs sitting on a tree branch, but everything shown was drawn unusually badly. And then he started talking, seemingly referring to the viewers. You sure you want to see this, dog? And you feeling my pain? Immediately after, the camera zoomed into his face, allowing us to see that he was crying uncontrollably, just as blood was coming out of his nose. Then he looked at the camera again and said, He heard me! Don't provoke him! Do not look for him! At that point, both the guard and I were feeling uncomfortable. It was such a disturbing video. And even though I suggested we stopped watching, he still wanted to continue. So I kept watching as well. The next scene showed Pepe Le Pew and his girlfriend Penelope Pussycat having an argument. Their fight gradually escalated, and soon they started hitting each other violently and brutally. The camera zoomed into Penelope's face. It was beaten up and covered in blood. The camera then moved down. And we saw how the bone of her right leg was protruding out of her flesh. Strangely, everything around it looked somewhat distorted except for the bone itself, which looked like a human bone. There was blood everywhere and noises of the cat and a skunk fighting invaded the scene. But suddenly, Duffy Duck appeared and said, Fighting again, you lovebirds? Is that what you want the children at home to be watching? If that's the case, why don't we make it a bit more fun? Then Daffy quickly took out a knife and started to stab Penelope over and over again, splattered in blood in all directions. It was a horrible and gruesome scene, and we could see how Daffy had an insane smile on his face. Pepe also seemed to be happy, making the scene even more strange and disturbing. We tried to stop the episode right there, but the buttons in the VHS player were no longer working and its lights started to flicker. On the screen, we then saw Duffy Duck decapitating Pepe Le Pew and then holding his severed head in front of the camera. The dog was screaming as if he was possessed. Is this what you want, kids? Do you like seeing blood? Soon your heads will be mine too. And then the scene changed, showing the dog devouring the entrails of his former friend. The worst part of that gruesome scene was the sounds, which were terrifyingly realistic. We tried to look away, but we soon noticed something horrifying. It was Daffy, who was getting closer and closer to the camera. He advanced, little by little, as if he was warning us that we were next. The screen then went black, and we heard another voice. It sounded like a girl yelling for help. Please, don't let them chop off my head! The guard and I were pale and shaken in horror. We tried to rush out of the store, but the doors were blocked. The lights then started to flicker, and it looked like there was no escape. In a fit of panic, the guard then grabbed his gun and shot himself. His body fell to the floor, and I could only think about how to escape. I broke a window, and fortunately, I managed to get home. The next day, I read the tragic news. Both the owner and the guard of Video World died that night. However, the owner wasn't with us that night, so I didn't understand what happened to him. Later on, I learned that his wife found his dead body, decapitated and without entrails, on his bed. And on the wall, there was a message painted in blood. I will be the worst nightmare of this entire town. Duffy Duck. <coughs> Believe it or not, Christmas spiders exist. And in Ukraine, Christmas trees are decorated with spider webs. Well, not literally. There are decorations that look like spider webs because they are said to attract luck. 
The story goes back a long time and tells of a poor woman who couldn't afford to buy ornaments to decorate her tree. The next morning, when she woke up, it was covered with beautiful spider webs that were shining. Other countries, such as Poland or Germany, consider that finding a spider or a spider web on the Christmas tree brings good luck. Did you know this curiosity? Seguimos we continue with another velada. video. The protagonist of this movie is Coraline, an 11-year-old girl who just moved to Oregon with her parents and feels pretty sad because she misses all of her friends she left behind in Michigan. Moreover, her parents barely spend any time with her, which makes her feel lonely. She's also a pretty curious and adventurous girl, so one day, when a mouse tries to guide her through the house, she doesn't hesitate to follow him. And so, she finds a secret door in the house and goes through it. Coraline can't believe what she finds on the other side. A parallel reality with a house just like hers but seemingly located in a different dimension. This parallel house is very similar to her real home, with the difference that her parents in that other dimension are much more loving and attentive, and everyone else is very nice. However, one disturbing detail about that world is that her parents have buttons stitched on their eyes. At first, that disturbs Coraline, but she becomes used to it over time. Over the next few days, Coraline discovers that many things there just don't make sense, and terrifyingly enough, her mother from that dimension tries to stitch buttons on her eyes too and make her stay in that world forever. And so Coraline has no other choice than to make a plan to save herself and go back home, since not only her, but her entire family are in grave danger. If you haven't watched it yet, Tic Tackers, we will not be spoiling the ending here, since you should totally experience it for yourselves. This animated movie is an adaptation of the novel by Neil Gaiman of the same name. The movie was critically acclaimed, so much so that it was even nominated for an Oscar for Best Animated Movie. It is clear that this story is as scary enough as it is Tic Tackers, but are you aware about what's actually behind it? After doing research on different internet forums, we learned about the terrible event that Neil Gaiman used as the base to write his book. Neil was born in a small English town named Hampshire, and it's precisely there where he found the inspiration to write his novel. In that town lived an old lady with her little granddaughter. They lived all alone, since the parents of the little girl died in a terrible fire. However, the girl survived thanks to her brave grandma, who bursted into the burning house to rescue her. And from that point on, many of the neighbors accused her of being a witch. However, after that terrible event, the grandma wouldn't allow her granddaughter to get out of the house for any reason, and didn't allow anybody to approach them either. The neighbors could only tell that they were alive thanks to the shadows that could be seen through the windows, and nothing else. People in the town would call her Evil Mother, since she wouldn't allow the little girl to go out to play or even breathe some fresh air. The mystery which surrounded that house sparked the curiosity of many, especially among young people, and among them was Neil Gaiman. Because of that, one night, while Neil and his friends were camping, they agreed to break into the old lady's house. Once inside, everything was very dark and a particular smell impregnated the entire place, a mix between humidity and muck. They also found some little girl clothes, so it seemed that it was true that the old woman's granddaughter lived there. The house was pretty small, so they didn't take long to find the room of the girl who they calculated to be around 10 years old in that moment. However, to their surprise, there was no bed in that room, but a crib. It was unthinkable that a girl of that age could be sleeping in a crib, so they decided to check if she was there. And what they saw left them frozen in shock. Inside the crib was a small body, completely carbonized. It was dressed and had buttons stitched where its eyes would be. They couldn't contain the horror they felt and screamed with all their might without stopping. Ah! 
up. This resulted in more of the neighbors coming into the house, who then called the police after witnessing such a disturbing scene. The agents then took the old lady to a psychiatric center. However, the story does not end there, TikTokers. When the police inspected the old woman's house, they found something even more disturbing. Books filled with information about the town's children, as well as many items related to witchcraft. And to top it all off, under the house, they found the remains of a girl who had disappeared years before. It is believed that the old woman wanted to use the body of another child as a vessel for the spirit of her granddaughter. Terrifying, isn't it? In Sweden, there is an important Christmas tradition, and that is watching a Donald Duck special. This television program is broadcasted on Christmas Eve at 3 in the afternoon, and all parties are planned around it so that families can watch it together. We have to confirm that Donald Duck is not Swedish. It is said that on some occasions, they have tried to remove him from the programming, and that large protests begun. Because Donald has his annual appointment with the Swedish people, it lasts about one hour and is almost always the same, except for one or two episodes. The Swedes know the dialogues almost by heart, and the children open their gifts right after. We found this tradition super curious. Let's now continue with a horror story, but in this case, based on the Disney World. Welcome to a new video, TikTokers. We know you love creepy versions of your favorite cartoons. And among them, the king of Disney has always stood out. Indeed, we are talking about Mickey Mouse, specifically of a missing episode that someone found and posted their impressions online. The story begins like this. It was night, around 12.30, and the weather was horrible. It was raining and the thunder was so strong that it looked like real earthquakes. I was in the middle of an amazing video game with a friend when I had an idea and asked him, would you be interested in seeing Mickey Mouse shorts? When I asked the question, I already knew the answer because the truth is that we both loved Mickey. He told me, of course. I already had the series disc on hand, so I quickly inserted it and the episode begun. At the beginning, we only saw a black screen, around 10 seconds. Then the title appeared with a reddish background and black letters. In a few seconds, we heard a sinister voice with horrifying music in the background that said, Mickey, the murderer. After this introduction, the episode began with his typical happy music. In the scene, Mickey was walking and whistling when he saw Goofy crying. But his crying was strange. It seemed like a real child, not a cartoon. That made my hair stain on end. To tell the truth, the animation was very poor, as if the cartoonist hadn't finished it. And the fact that caught my attention was that the voices of the characters were not as I remember them. In addition, the movements were very real and fluid. Mickey did not move like a cartoon Mickey, but like a flesh and blood child. When Mickey met Goofy, he said, What's wrong, Goofy? Nothing, Mickey, he replied. If nothing happens to you, why are you crying? Mickey asked him again. But in the scene, we saw in Mickey's face that it was evident that he was not going to answer. There was a brief silence, and then he added, Why don't we go to my house? You'll be better there. Goofy nodded, and they started walking. The next scene was traumatic. We saw how Goofy walked backwards and suddenly Mickey appeared with a knife and began to stab him in an extremely savage way. The victim's screams sounded surprisingly real, they were almost unbearable. And when everything seemed to end because we were watching Mickey withdraw the knife, he did it again with even more force and this time at the temple. Afterwards, he started laughing like he was possessed by a demon. That was accompanied by terrifying music and canned laughter. The scene went black for a few seconds and then started showing us real photos at intervals. In them, we could see a man dressed as Mickey in an unknown place. It was only illuminated by a light bulb, but next to it we could see multiple decomposing corpses. 
There was blood everywhere, and the scene made you want to vomit. In the following images, the same man was staring at the camera, which gave us real terror. It seemed that he was looking at us. And just at that moment, music started playing and the voice came back again. You will be next. At that point, I decided that was enough for me, so I got up and tried to remove the disc from the player. But unfortunately for me, it didn't work. We had to keep looking at photos. The following was of horribly mutilated children and several dead people. The images were getting worse and more realistic. And suddenly, the animation returned. We watched Mickey devour what appeared to be human guts. There were decomposing bodies everywhere. He chewed with his mouth open, making a disgusting noise. In the background, a melody like a music box sounded and murmurs were heard. At that time, the animation was of higher quality. And when he finished chewing, Mickey looked at the camera and laughing shamelessly said, If you fall asleep, I will torture you in your dreams. The screen turned black and in red capital letters we could read, To be continued. Then we saw more bodies and then the credits. I was totally stunned. Does the episode end like this? Is this show for children? I threw my thoughts up, but my friend seemed to completely ignore me. He was very pale and suddenly he said, True pain is never revealed. At that moment, he went to the kitchen and stuck a knife in his throat. I screamed, completely terrified. I called the police and they came right away. They took my friend's body. Through tears, I told them what happened, but I don't know if they believed me at all. I think it was all my fault. If I had not put the cursed episode, none of this would have happened. We love that you tell us traditions from your countries, because we are surprised at how many different ways there are to celebrate Christmas celebrations in each part of the world. One that we loved was sent to us by a TikToker from Venezuela. She told us that it's very typical there that on the morning of December 25th in Caracas, the streets are filled with parishioners on their way to the Christmas Mass. The most curious thing is that they do it on skates. This has become so popular that many streets are closed to traffic on that day, so that everyone can get to church safely. From children to older people, everyone who can put on their skates to join the party. Did you know this custom? We continue with another video. I remember the first time I saw him. I went for a walk around the neighborhood that night, just like I do every night. I wasn't afraid of the dark, and my neighborhood was pretty peaceful. The worst crimes that had occurred there were shoplifting and some drivers going over the speed limit. I was walking around the park and decided to sit on a bench under a street light, when suddenly a black cat appeared in front of me. I heard him purr and he didn't seem aggressive, so when he approached me, I started to pet him. He started purring more and started to rub himself against my leg. How cute. I could have swore that he was smiling, but that was obviously impossible. Then, all of a sudden, some rando whispered something from behind the nearby bushes and the cat <coughs> ran away, scared. That really annoyed me, but it was getting very late anyways, so I decided to head back home. I got to my door and when I put in the key, I heard a meow behind me. I turned around and there he was, the same cat sitting on the ground looking at me directly. I knew it was not a good idea to feed stray animals, but I couldn't help myself. He looked very hungry. I went inside, quickly grabbed a small plate and put a bit of ham on it. I then opened the door to give it to the cat, but he was no longer there. He had vanished once again. I decided to leave the plate with him in front of my door in case he decided to come back. It was about 11.30 at night, so I went straight to bed. That night, I was jolted awake by something that hit my window. It was a loud hit, so it really scared me. I turned around to see what was happening, and I saw the same cat again sitting on the right side of the window. This time, he was definitely smiling. 
He was waving his tail happily and he wouldn't stop staring at me for a second. I usually close my curtains at night, but weirdly enough, this time around they were open for some reason. I was completely disconcerted, but after a few hours of tossing and turning in bed, I finally fell asleep. The next day, when I woke up, I was so sleepy that I didn't remember what had happened. I got ready for work and went out of the house. I drove for the 30 minutes that separate my house and my workplace while thinking about that strange feline. And just when I arrived, right in the parking lot, there he was again, sitting and smiling, looking directly at me. It was then I knew something strange was going on. I called animal control and the cat was taken away. I went home after work and tried to calm down, although I couldn't stop thinking about that weird cat the entire afternoon. And just before falling asleep, I heard as if someone had kicked my bedroom door. I thought it must have been the washing machine or one of those common sounds at night. And so I immediately went back to sleep. However, that morning, I found out it hadn't been just a common sound. I froze in shock when I saw that damn cat laying at the border of my bed, sleeping and with the same creepy smile on his face. That was enough. I grabbed the cat by my neck, threw him into the backyard, I grabbed my shovel and beat him up to death. And during the entire process, the cat didn't make a single sound. Once I finally came back to my senses, I saw how the cat was now completely unrecognizable. His back legs were broken, his right ear was cut, his ribs were shattered, and his face had turned into a gory and mushy hole. I couldn't believe what I had just done. I was a monster. I had to go to work that day, so I put the cat's mutilated body in a box, went to the other side of the city, and buried it near a forest at the other side of the road. I was very troubled about what I had done. How did that cat get to my house, let alone my bedroom? I tried not to think about it, but I was so perturbed that at work I asked for permission to go back home. I threw myself into my bed. I just wanted to forget everything. I woke up confused and remembering what happened, I looked outside my window once more. And when I did, I saw something that left me scarred for the rest of my life. It was the same cat, again, with his body still completely broken and with a smile bigger than ever before, looking at me directly without blinking. And this time around, his eyes were completely black. As he glared at me, he started to move in a very strange way, with his left leg still half destroyed and his ear still bleeding. I screamed and ran out of there into my car. I got in and drove as far away from the city as I possibly could. Now I'm trying to start a new life in a new state and I'm unable to look out of any window since I live in a constant fear of seeing that horrible cat once more. And the time has come to put an end to this 2023 Christmas night special. We are very close to the new year. We want to thank you for your unmatched support for another year. We could never thank you enough for all the love you offer us. We are very proud of this community. 99.9% .9 of you who are here always give us words of affection, complicity, celebrate our achievements. Sometimes we wonder if it is real that we can have so much affection on the other side of the screen. Thank you for being home and being family. We love you, Tic Tacers. And now we leave you with the last video of this evening. Big hug and Merry Christmas. The three had received a strange message. They were invited to a Christmas dinner on December 24th. There, seated each one on one side of the table, they could not stop looking at each other with curiosity. They were Titi Toby, Maskey, and Hootie, Slenderman's proxies. In fact, all three were convinced that the faceless man was responsible for that meeting. Who else would know where to find them? 
Who would dare to bring three people like them together? They had all doubted the veracity of the summons, but since none of them had anything to lose, they agreed. They entered that abandoned ship very alertly. They were armed and did not trust the others at all. After all, they had all done terrible things and were capable of anything. Their names were placed on the table, marking each one's place. Once they were seated, a voiceover over the loudspeakers invited them to read a paper with instructions. Welcome, diners. We knew you were going to spend Christmas alone, so we wanted you to have company. But don't worry, there will be excitement too. You got in, so now you won't be able to get out until we let you in. As you can see, there are three large fountains on the table. When we tell you, you will have to uncover each one of them. And here comes the interesting part. Some of the food is poisoned, so it's up to you to live or die. Not eating is not an option. At that moment, they looked at each other, puzzled. They were used to fighting, to resurrecting from the deepest wounds, but they had never faced something like this. It was Russian roulette, but with poison. And although they didn't say so, they began to suspect that Slenderman was not behind the situation. Who was it then? While they were pondering the matter, the loudspeakers blared again. It is time to start with source number one. Hootie uncovered it and the three of them looked at all the details of the meal. It looked perfectly normal, nothing seemed to indicate that it was in bad shape. Tichi Toby went first, grabbed the spoon and poured some of the food onto his plate. Without hesitation, he put it in his mouth and swallowed. The other two watched him, waiting for something to happen, but nothing did. Next was Hootie, who chopped up some of the chicken and also stuffed it into his mouth without thinking. Maskey thought about it more. Behind that mask was hiding fear after a long time without feeling it. But his doubts were not pleasing the organizers of the meal, who immediately reproached him for waiting over the loudspeakers. Maskey finally ate and the three of them stood perfectly still. What were they to expect? Would one of them start to feel really sick? The seconds sticked by and nothing changed. They waited for about 15 minutes. Time was running slow and they wished they had not accepted the invitation. When the 15 minutes were up, the voice encouraged them to eat from the second plate. When they lifted it, they saw that it was a multitude of vegetables. Now the three of them did it quickly. Better to avoid waiting and suffering. Within seconds, Tichi Toby began to cough. He was very red and could hardly breathe, and the other two looked at him but did not help him. They didn't know what to do. Then the voice appeared again and said, Tichi, do you want to stay for dinner or leave? He hesitated for a few seconds but chose to stay until the end. Meanwhile, the coffin did not stop and he was breathing with increasing difficulty. By the time the voice ordered them to eat from the third course, he was already passed out. The other two now hesitated. Since nothing had happened the first time, they had hoped that it was a bad joke, but seeing Tichi like that, they knew it was real. They grabbed the spoon and began to eat. Two minutes passed and it seemed that nothing new was happening. But the voice appeared again. Your mate has to eat. If he doesn't, you must make sure he does. Titi Toby was unconscious, so they would have to feed him. They looked at each other and nodded, as if giving the okay to the instructions. They approached and Hootie pulled his black mask away from his mouth as Maskey stuffed food into it. At that moment, Titi woke up and stuffed each of them as two men manhandled them from behind. It was a trap, and now they knew who was responsible. How would Christmas dinner end? Things were really bad. Tichi Toby had set up Maskey and Hurdy, who ended up tied to a chair and with an open wound in their side. The two, though they didn't say it verbally, were cursing themselves inside. How had they been so stupid as to trust a killer? 
It was clear that this invitation was a double-edged sword, but since they had a Slenderman in common, they were all hopeful that for once it wasn't all about killing and fighting. But they were there and they had to find a way to survive. Were they going to trust each other to defeat Tichitobi or were they going to act separately? They were both thinking about it as they analyzed everything around them. This in just 30 seconds, because Tichi kept circling around their chairs. It was clear that he was up to something, so everyone was very alert. And suddenly, the voice begins to play again. I see you've already figured out that you are not friends and this is not a normal Christmas meal. Now it remains to find out how you're going to manage to get out of there alive. The three looked at each other and even Tichi Toby looked puzzled. That caught Maskey's attention, who began to think that maybe he had simply defended himself. Maybe he didn't know what they were doing there either. But that he would have to find out later, because Tichi was determined to fool them. An unfamiliar voice came on this time. Let's get on with the game. One of the three of you knows what you're doing in this place. You must guess who it is. If you guess, I will confirm it and you will have to force him to talk. But I'm warning you that it will be difficult for him to do so. You have 20 seconds to think about it. The three of them turned to look at each other, but time was running fast and some of them still did not have a clear idea. After what happened, Maskey and Hoody said that Tichi Toby was the one who was aware of what was going on. Tichi said it was Hoody who knew everything. No one gave them an answer. Everything was silent. Tichi was the only one who had his hands untied, but he still wasn't trying to kill his buddies. That was the strangest thing. Maski kept looking at Hoody. He wanted to propose him to collaborate to get out of there. But he wasn't looking at him, so he had to make a slight noise to get his attention. He did it when Tichi was walking around the room. So Hoody agreed, and they got as close together as possible. They were already quite close together, so the difference wasn't noticeable, but it did allow them to untie each other. Hody was the first to get free and then untied Maskey. This with extreme care, so much so that Tichi Toby was not aware of anything until the other two pounced on him. Surprisingly, the two men who had tied them up had done absolutely nothing to prevent it. It was clear that it was in the organizers' plans that they would beat each other up. And the worst part was being taken by Tichi Toby, who was already bleeding all over his face and barely opening his eyes. Hoodie was totally out of control. He wanted to kill him and that's why he kept hitting him. Tichi's face was completely disfigured and he was no longer putting up any resistance. Then Hoodie got up and saw that Maskey was sitting on the side of the table, crestfallen. Shall we go? he said. And then the voice came again. Well, well, Hoodie, so now you don't want to be a lone wolf anymore. Just so you know, you were wrong. The test was just this. Maskey was aware that you were not to cooperate. He simply set you up, and you fell for it. Hoodie looked at his partner with fury in his eyes and didn't hesitate a moment to go after him. He grabbed him by the throat, ready to strangle him, but the latter pulled out a dagger and plunged it into him. At that moment, they saw how a shadow of a large man with long arms was projected on the wall. It was him, Slenderman, coming to see which of the two survived the Christmas dinner. Pooty and Muskie fighting, while Tichi Toby was badly injured because they gave him a beating. You must remember that a Slenderman had joined the party. He wanted to witness the fight to see who survived. In the end, the one who knew everything was Maskey, who didn't hesitate to set a trap for Hoody. This fact completely enraged him, and for this reason, they were in that situation. Hoody already had two stab wounds to his body, the one from Tichi and the one from Maskey. But instead of giving up, he was more furious. When he could free himself from the knife Maskey had thrust into him, he backed away quickly 
to push forward with all his might and kick him down. Maskey did not expect the attack so quickly and fell to the ground. Hody got on top of him and put his hand on his neck. Again, he was trying to drown him, but the battle was not going to be easy. Maskey managed to free himself from the hands of his enemy and with a jump he was placed on the other side of the room. The two of them stood, looking at each other, trying to figure out what was going through the other's head. Neither of them really wanted to be there. What was the point of that Christmas dinner? And at that moment, with everything quiet, Slenderman came out. He approached them and said, This is a lesson. From the moment I received you and you agreed to follow my path, you're alone. You cannot have friends. You cannot feel compassion. The only alternative to this is death. Does anyone want to die? And that caused the battle to continue. Suddenly, the two of them walked forward to meet, and that led to a lot of punches and kicks that made the two of them bleed all over their bodies. However, none seemed to lose energy and they were willing to go to the end. Dishes had been blown up and the floor was littered with food, and Maskey took advantage of it. He grabbed a broken plate and slid Hody's abdomen, who fell to the ground badly injured. That fact made Maskey laugh out loud, and Slenderman was very happy. He was enjoying doing damage. Maskey grabbed a fork and shoved it all over Hody's body. It looked like he was prodding food. The scene was gruesome, there was blood everywhere, and Maskey continued to pierce Hody's body, which was no longer resisting. But the fight didn't end there. While Maskey was distracted by his victim, someone grabbed a chair and threw it at his head. Maskey fell directly on top of Hootie's body, unconscious. And who had it been? Tichi Toby, who despite the blows had managed to survive. And not only that, he had been smart enough to wait for the right moment. He knew that if he participated in the fight, he had a much higher chance of losing. Then, if he pretended to be dead and showed up when the others were already lost. He was the winner of the Christmas dinner. Slenderman congratulated him and let him go. After all, intelligence is more powerful than force. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it. And if you want to see more Draw My Life videos, subscribe to our channel. See you in the next episode!